Hi there, I'm Brother Merrill and this is Sunshine for the Soul Inspirational Stories. I appreciate you watching, I appreciate all the comments and the inspirational stories that people share with me and see the hand of the Lord in each of our lives. He loves us. I was very grateful this week to receive my copy of a book that Jake from Family History Storybooks made for me about my great-great-grandfather, Mariner Wood Merrill. It's a wonderful book. The pictures are awesome. And I'm going to recount some of the stories that are in it. There's still time to order these for Christmas. You get 10 of them. And right now you get $100 off if you use the promotional code SUNSHINE. It's a great deal. And they're beautiful books. My great-great-grandfather, Mariner Wood Merrill, his mother was one of the first people to be baptized into the church outside of the United States. But there was a strong public sentiment against the church, including from her husband. And so she kept her conversion secret from the family and from her neighbors. When Mariner was quite young, he had a dream. And in his dream, he saw himself crossing the plains, settling out west he saw many things about his life in this dream. One of the things he saw was that he would have more than one wife at the same time. He went and asked his mother if she'd ever heard of such a thing. She told her that it was called polygamy and that it was practiced by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints at that time. Then she confided in him that she was indeed a member of the church and he was soon converted to the church. Mariner joined the company of William Atkinson as they left Sackville and made their way west. He was amazed to see vast herds of buffalo. He decided that they were probably at one time domesticated animals of the Nephites. The path that the saints took generally followed the Platte River, and in doing so, they'd have to cross the river quite regularly. Mariner did not know how to swim. As they were crossing the river at one location, some of the brethren told him that he could wade across and he'd be okay. But as he began to work his way across the river, he was swept away by the current and was soon drowning. He went under several times. And the last time that he went under, he miraculously felt a sandbar swirling and forming under his feet and it lifted him up and a one-eyed Welshman swam out and rescued him. So he was delivered from a certain death. They arrived in the valley on September 11, 1853. He said it was a wasteland. The saints had been able to scratch a few farms and plant a few crops. They'd only been there six years. There were a few homes. But he said it was primarily just barren desert, no trees. There were Indians roaming around, large gray wolves, coyotes, all kinds of creatures. It seemed like everything was against them settling here. The weather was extreme. It was just a struggle to survive. Mariner had arrived in the valley with just the clothes on his back. He soon decided that if he worked hard, he could make decent money making shingles. And they used axes and hand sledges to split shingles. And they got $8 per thousand for the shingles. In November of 1853, Mariner married Sarah Atkinson, who had crossed the plains with. And they were an industrious couple. She worked hard and worked right alongside of him. And they moved in with her brother into a very small log home. And they were able to convince a sister, Perry, the following spring to let them break 20 acres of land and plant crops. And their pay for their work that summer was the produce that they had grown. Mariner continued to do logging and work hard Sarah and Mariner soon determined that they would never get ahead if he just continued to do piecework and if he continued to work for other people. So they tried to secure some land of their own. There was a man in Bountiful 
who had claimed a great deal of land. And Mariner went to him and tried to negotiate for a hundred acres that he was never going to use. He wouldn't sell it. He wouldn't talk about it. So Mariner went to his bishop, and the bishop told him, there's nothing I can do about it. Not to be deterred, Mariner went to the territorial surveyor, and he explained the situation. So the surveyor introduced Mariner Wood Merrill to Brigham Young. And when he explained what his desire was, Brigham told the surveyor to make out a deed for the 100 acres. Mariner had title to 100 acres. He knew that he couldn't develop the 100 acres by himself, and so he gave 33 and a third acres to his father-in-law, William Atkinson, and then he gave another 33 and a third acres to a Welch family who had no money to buy land with. And when Brigham heard what he had done, he told him that he would be blessed in this land and he would prosper. Mariner and Sarah were industrious, hardworking people. Sarah made butter and sold it so she could acquire a few nails and a few panes of glass for the home they wanted to build. She also spun the wool, wove the wool on a loom, sewed the clothing, and in her spare time she cooked meals and she made their shoes. So she was a very hard-working woman. And Mariner was a real hard-working, energetic, organized man. When he wasn't logging or doing other things to secure income, he was working night and day on building their little house. He made a stack of over 500 adobe bricks and had them ready to start laying the foundation of the house when an unexpected rainstorm came up and just washed it all away. He just started over. He made more adobe. He continued to log. He traded his shares for lumber for his home. And by that fall, they had a little 16 by 20 stucco home. That fall, Mariner's first child, Phoebe, was born. And this is what he said. Thus, in a little over a year after I came to the Salt Lake Valley, a young boy, penniless, through the blessings of Heavenly Father, I had a kind, good wife, one nice girl baby, a home of my own, an unbroken farm of 33 and a third acres, one yoke of splendid oxen, 90 bushels of wheat, 20 bushels of nice potatoes, a new wagon, a fat hog and a cow. Thus it was demonstrated in my case that the Lord helps those who make an effort to help themselves. In the mid-1850s, the endowment house was completed, and Sarah and Mariner Wood were sealed for time and eternity by Brigham Young. Food that year was very scarce. The crickets had come in and destroyed much of the crop. That fall, as the cold weather approached, it said that wheat and flour were as precious as gold. Mariner had a large load of wood, and he went down to the church's facility. He explained to the bishop that he had to have flour to support his family during the winter. They gave him 500 pounds of flour. Once he got home, they were very generous with their flour. They did not deny anyone that came to their home. And one evening, a cold winter night, a knock came at the door, and there was a man standing there, and he was in rather tattered clothing, and he asked if he could have something to eat. So Sarah invited him in, and she gave him bread and milk. As he bowed his head and blessed that meal, a powerful spirit came into the home. And he ate, and then he excused himself, and he seemed to just disappear. And Mariner and Sarah, as they talked of the company of that good man, they felt that he was possibly one of the three Nephites, or some other heavenly being, who had come to test their devotion and charity. In the winter of 1855-1856, it was a heavy winter. 
there were a group of men going up to Mill Creek Canyon, cutting down trees and bringing them home. But a huge storm came in, and the men had to team up and spend a week clearing a path up to the canyon. It was estimated to be below zero, even though there were no thermometers in the valley at that point. But it was cold. And one morning, when Mariner began to get ready for work, Sarah pled with him not to go to work that day. It was just too cold, and the fog was so thick. Mariner assured her that he would make a quick day of it, and so he loaded up the oxen, he got him hitched and took his sled, and when he got up to the logging area, he was surprised to find he was completely alone. None of the other men had come up that day because of the cold. So he climbed the side of the canyon. He was able to bring five trees down the chute and limb them. His sled was sitting at a slight angle, and it was with great difficulty using his logging hook that he was able to get the first log up on the sled and block it in place. And as he turned around to get the next log, the first log gave way and came down and hit him right in the back and rested on the back of his legs and pinned him over the other four logs. The logging hook had been knocked from his hands, as he laid there, he thought, this is how I'm going to die. He could feel the life draining out of him. And he thought, Sarah and Phoebe will be alone. The next thing he knew, he was riding down the canyon. The oxen were making their way home. He was sitting on his sled, which was loaded with the five logs. His axe was bedded in the end of one of the logs, and they had been secured three on the bottom, two on the top, exactly as he had designed to do it. When he got home, Sarah ran out, picked him up, brought him into the house, and he was hardly able to move for a week. He was so bruised and injured. But on further inquiry with the men that had not gone logging that day, no one knew anything about it. And Mariner knew that he had once again been spared by divine intervention. Mariner was called to live the law of polygamy by Brigham Young, and he married Cyrene Stanley. They had heard that Cache Valley had opened up, and it was a beautiful agricultural valley, and there was a lot of land available. Early the next spring, Mariner and his second wife made their way up to Cache Valley to secure some property. They were very disappointed after a difficult journey coming around the north end of the Wellsville Mountains, and as they first looked down into Cache Valley, it was completely blanketed with snow. And when they had left Salt Lake Valley, it was completely bare. They made their way into town, and Mariner was able to secure a 20-acre parcel of land outside of the town of Richmond and a building lot in town. They got busy, they planted crops, they worked, and he was able to bring logs down from the mountains, and they scrapped together a 16 by 30 foot log home. And then he went back to Bountiful to pick up Sarah and the rest of their belongings. When Sarah saw her new house, this is what he said. On reaching our home, Sarah could not avoid the tears flowing freely from her eyes in beholding our new home. But this little incident soon passed. Shortly after that experience, Mariner was called to be the Bishop of Richmond, a position he served in for 18 years. He continued to work hard and was able to secure other properties and other farms and ranches. And soon he had people working for him. And his prosperity seemed to cause jealousy with people. And soon there were people that were spreading rumors that the way he was getting ahead was stealing the money from the ward. And so one of the authorities from Salt Lake came up enraged, demanding to see the records. And Mariner said to him, Just keep your shirt on, brother. I'll account for every item and every bushel this ward has received. And he had kept meticulous records. So the man apologized after reviewing them, and he realized that Mariner was honest in, his, in serving the Lord as bishop. There was a great deal to do in Cache Valley. Mariner soon became the postmaster, and the railroads 
were coming into the area and he began to work as a contractor for the railroads, building the roads that they would lay the tracks on. He used the money from this enterprise to buy a grist mill, and he also became a partial owner in one of the lumber mills in town. And he continued to work hard, and he prospered. During that time, he was called to be in the stake presidency, and he served there faithfully. His reputation grew. The prosperity also brought jealousy, and word reached Salt Lake that he was a dishonest man. He could not be trusted. He was a schemer. During that time, the saints were all involved building the Logan Temple. And as the Logan Temple neared completion, President John Taylor had a short list of men that were being considered to be the first temple president. But he had heard of the reputation of Mariner Wood Merrill, so Mariner was not even on the list. And as the prophet fervently prayed about who the new temple president should be, the voice of the Spirit whispered, Mariner Wood Merrill. But he dismissed this because of all the things he'd heard. He continued to fast and pray about it, and then quite emphatically, he was told Mariner Wood Merrill will be the first Logan Temple president. And so he was called. One day while Mariner was sitting in the office of the temple, he noticed a large congregation of people taking possession of the temple grounds. Mariner left his office. He went outside. He surveyed the group. He watched for a while, determined who the leader was. He walked up to the man and said, who are you? The man stepped towards him aggressively and said, I am Satan. The mariner didn't back down. He got nose to nose and said, what are you doing here? What do you want? And he said, I've come here to stop this work. The mariner told him that they would not stop this work. Then Satan told him, if you will not stop this work, I will disperse this company throughout this valley and we will stop this work. Mariner raised his arm to the square and through the power of the priesthood commanded them to leave. Within a few moments, over 3,500 people had vanished. But for years and years afterwards, all hell conspired to keep anyone from going to the temple. People had to develop little signals if they wanted to go to the temple. While they were in the temple, the husband would be like a third base coach. He'd say, oh, when I do that, that means get your stuff. We're going to the temple, honey. <laughs> because if they didn't, everything happened. Wagons broke down, horses died, whatever, to keep them from coming to the temple. Mariner's industry continued. He helped form the Richmond Co-op and Mercantile Association. And it was a thriving part of the community. There was a real deep, serious depression in the late 1800s. And Brigham Young asked Mariner to pledge that he would not let the Richmond Co-op fail during his lifetime. And so during that depression, Mariner had to sell what he said was the finest farm in all of Cache Valley to pay the needs of the co-op. But he kept it operating and he kept it running. When Brigham Young heard what he was doing, he promised him that his children and grandchildren would never want for bread. So Mariner's personal wealth was used to continue to support the Richmond Co-op and Mercantile Association and keep that important part of the community thriving. He was a man of his word. John Taylor approached him and asked him for a thousand dollars. He didn't tell him what it was for and Mariner gave him the money. The money was invested under Mariner's name in a mining enterprise and the dividends from that investment paid all of the advanced educational expenses for every one of his children. So the promise of Brigham Young had been realized. On October 7th of 1889, Mariner Wood Merrill was called by Wilford Woodruff to be an apostle. He served faithfully in that calling. He was also at that point on the board of trustees for Brigham Young College, 
which later became Utah State University. He still was postmaster. He still had many farms and ranches throughout the valley, but he worked hard. He served as temple president and apostle at the same time. In 1899, he was called to be the stake president of the cash stake. So for two years, he served as a stake president, a temple president, and an apostle all at the same time. His oldest son, Mariner Jr., played an important role in helping him in his business enterprises. And in the year 1899, his oldest son passed away. The old apostle mourned terribly for this loss. It was a huge burden for him. He now had to scramble to meet the needs that he had for the businesses that he was involved with. He also had to fill his callings for his ecclesiastical duties. And one day as he was riding in a light buggy on his way out to a farm in Smithfield, his son Mariner rode up on a white horse. They tied the horse to the buggy and continued on the journey, and Mariner Jr. spoke to him and said, Father, the order of heaven is that I have an important role to help any of my loved ones who need help. But I've been called to the other side to do a very important work, and it's taking a great deal of my time. And yet I'm constantly interrupted because you're mourning my death. And your mourning causes me to leave the calling I have on the other side and come and comfort you. Please realize that I will be fine and that my children and my grandchildren will be fine. Mariner Jr. had three families. My grandfather was one of his children. The old apostle took his son at his word. And he quit worrying about Mariner Jr.'s children. And he focused on the things that he needed to focus on. He owned a sawmill, a grist mill. He started the Cash Valley Creamery, which later became Cash Valley Cheese. He established the Utah Condensed Milk Company and built a factory. And he was part of the first sugar beet factory ever built in the United States in Lehigh, Utah. So he was involved in a great deal of industry. He was truly one of the pioneers of the West. He was an amazing man. When he passed away, Mariner had 46 children, 227 grandchildren, and 459 great-grandchildren. And today, Mariner Wood Merrill's Posterity is one of the largest families in the LDS Church. I hope you've enjoyed this. I'll put a few pictures along with it that aren't in the book. I'd urge anyone that's interested to check out Family History Storybooks. They're beautiful books. You get 10 of them, and it's a good price. You can get $100 off. Make great gifts for your grandchildren. So take a look at that website. I'll put a link to it and a QR code that takes you right to their site in the first comment after this. I hope you've enjoyed this today. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe to my channel right here. And if you enjoyed this story, you'll probably enjoy this one. And all of Sunshine for the Soul inspirational stories are right here. Thank you.